right. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is the Denver Crypto Group's uh, Learn Something New Night. We do it every month. That's one of our four themes. We've got about four, uh, we generally do four meetings a month. Um, and, uh, you know, we try to focus on beginner education, learning something new. We kind of do a little bit of investment stuff as our third one. And then the fourth uh, weekend a month is generally a guest speaker, kind of, you know, a little more open source uh, and turn it over to what the, the members are wanting. So. Thank you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. We got an awesome speaker tonight. Andrew Kronoski from the Archer Tax Group is going to give us basically the lowdown on all the tax stuff that you need to know and what the IRS is doing and where you can really run into trouble. So if you got your crypto, you've got it all secured, you put all that effort and learning into it, it's going to be a great presentation. Learn how to protect it and keep Uncle, Uncle Sam from uh, getting his hands on it. So. Um, that's about it for me. I'm going to turn it over to him, and uh, yeah, thanks. Hey, everybody. So I mentioned, I'm Andrew Kronowski. I'm the owner of Archer Tax Group. We've been in the crypto space for about two years now. I've been in taxes for about half a decade, both on the representation and preparation side of things. Um, so not only do we know how to get you out of trouble, we know how to keep you out of trouble in the first place. Um, jumping in right away, nice lovely disclosure. As with all good tax advice, the answer is always it depends. If you want specific answers about your situation, hire a qualified tax professional. I cannot stress the qualified enough. This presentation is really only meant to give a high-level overview. If you want more direct information, go to our website. We've actually got free consultation for 15 minutes. Feel free to reach out to us. We love answering questions to keep people out of trouble just in general. So, like I said, we specialize in uh, crypto-specific tax planning. We've been in business as Archer Tax Group since 2015. Uh, personally, I've got half a decade, and like I said, tax resolution, so those lovely commercials of if you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS or state, give us a call. <laughs> I think I've argued with every state short of Idaho, and so if you've got issues with Idaho, give me a call. I'd love to add that one and check all 50 states off. Um, personally, I invest, I loan, I mine. Um, I'm working on a couple different projects on the ICO front, um, and then also trying to get a little bit more involved on the technical side. I'm a firm believer that if you're not actually, as a tax professional, in the guts of cryptocurrency, you really have no idea what's going on. You can't really speak authoritatively on it. I don't advise anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. And so we take some conservative positions, and we take some that are probably a little bit more shades of gray when it comes to the law. But we do that with a well-researched well intention, and we can back up everything that we do and say with specific law so that if we do get into trouble, we have a backdoor out as far as a case against the IRS. And I am what's known as an IRS enrolled agent. My designation does not come from any state board. It comes from the IRS directly. I've taken tests on individual tax law, business tax law, and the representation and ethics. I think the National Association of Enrolled Agents says we're America's tax experts, and that's absolutely true. We focus wholly on the law and nothing else. Um, all the accounting I've done is self-taught or through college, um, and so we focus mostly on the tax law, and that gives us a very good picture, especially with cryptocurrency as things are being developed and decided. Because we know the back end of the IRS, we also know how to prepare an argument for cryptocurrency and specific issues related with the taxes. So what we've got so far, there's been one notice put out by the IRS, and that's notice 2014-21, so if you're paying attention, came out in 2014. So this argument that the IRS has no idea what's going on with cryptocurrency is a little bit false. They gave out this notice and they basically said in this notice, um, cryptocurrency is treated as property, not as if it were foreign currency. In some cases, it can be treated as a, a security. And right now, um, they also give the idea of what happens when you get paid in cryptocurrency. And there's a couple other key things that we'll dive into specifically in that notice. Um, but as far as a regulatory body goes as to whether or not things are securities versus commodities versus currencies, everyone's kind of jockeying in the United States for who has clear jurisdiction. Sometimes the SEC says something's not a security, but the CFTC might come in and say, well, it's a commodity, which regulates such. So there's a little bit of a gray area here. I mean, as I mentioned, because I've got the back end of knowing, at least on the tax side, how things play out, we're trying to make sure that taxpayers, as they're filing their returns and acting in good faith, are going to be protected and not taking unnecessary measures that put them at more risk. And then, obviously, SEC is pursuing bad actors right now on the securities front. The IRS actually put out a notice a month and a half ago where they talked about their five focus areas for 2018. Number two, in big, scary... IRS capital letters was virtual currencies, which is their code for cryptos. And at the very last sentence of that paragraph, they say, at this time, there is no intention for an amnesty program related to virtual currencies. Enforcement's coming, and it's going to come hard. So be prepared for that. Make sure that you're keeping good records 
or as best records as you can, especially for those that have been in this, the uh, ecosystem for a while and might have trading from 2013 that they haven't been tracking. Um, it's a good idea to try and pull those records together now before the IRS comes to you. So, all crypto transactions generally have some sort of capital gain or capital loss basis working with them. That is the fundamental part of every transaction. How you acquire your crypto makes a huge difference for how we determine that basis, um, whether you're buying it, whether you're getting paid in it. We'll walk through a couple of those transactions with some, some real life case studies, you know, at least made up real life case studies that a lot of people run into, um, of how we actually go about valuing that basis and making sure we've got those calculations done correctly. I keep hitting the laser button. And then also there's additional taxes above and beyond capital gains tax that can apply. So if you're getting paid in cryptocurrency, you can be liable for self-employment taxes, ordinary income taxes, um, and even potentially estate taxes, depending on how we're moving around for gifting, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. So my favorite issue by far, because this is the one that tends to ruin everybody's night, is whether or not 1031 exchange or the rules for like-kind exchange, as we're more commonly known, are actually applying to crypto because it is de designated as property. However, when you start looking at the actual laws, there's not really a compelling case for like kind of change within crypto. So as of 2018, with the our Tax Cuts and Jobs Act being passed in 2017, they definitively said if it's not real property, which is essentially real estate, like kind of exchange is no longer valid for trading in you know cars for cars or manufacturing equipment, uh, and then definitively shuts the door on cryptocurrency. But uh, my professional opinion, and this is done after months and months of research and looking at the laws, looking at other court cases and, and digging into what the IRS is probably going to go after, um, a lot of people think that they can just declare, you know, Michael Scott office style running around the office screaming, I declare bankruptcy, and they think that that's declaring bankruptcy. People think just running around screaming, I'm declaring like kind of exchange without filing any of the appropriate paperwork mm -hmm. is going to protect them. The real answer is for every single transaction, so anytime that you trade Ethereum for Bitcoin, Bitcoin for Ripple, You've got a transaction. Each of those transactions, you have to file a form 8824. So for those of you that have 5,000 transactions and think that you're going to claim like an exchange, you have to have 5,8824s for each individual transaction to establish basis and to show the exchange fees and the, the shift in fair market value in order to, to reasonably claim like kind exchange. And I guarantee you, I have yet to talk to a single person that goes, yep, I've got all my 8824s for, for my taxes. Most people go, well, what, what's an 8824? I just thought, you know, the Trump was taking that away. When we actually break it into the rules and look at the spirit of the law for like-kind exchange, the categories that are explicitly excluded are inventories for stock and trade, stocks, bonds, notes, other securities or debts, partnership interests, and certificates of trust. So when we start looking at what cryptocurrency is, and we start thinking about how it's used and how it moves through the ecosystems, does it function more like one of these items, or does it function like a piece of manufacturing equipment? More often than not, especially as tokens are being reallocated as security tokens, I think the IRS is going to have a very compelling case that's going to operate more like other securities. As of right now, we haven't seen any court cases that have come out yet specifically denying like-kind exchange, but from my personal you know, research and expectation is there's not really a defensible argument for why like-kind exchange will apply especially considering you cannot trade. And, and for me, I always try to find like the most analogous or you know, most like item as far as prior court cases. And to me, you know, I've heard Bitcoin be referred to as digital gold, and I think it's a great, great analogy. Because you've got the financial aspect of it, the store value, gold can be used as a commodity in a business, and then there's all sorts of derivatives and things built off of gold. The IRS specifically states within the revenue rulings listed here back in 1979 and 1982 that you cannot trade gold for gold, unless it is the same purity and going from gold coins to gold bullion. You can't trade gold for silver. You can't trade American Eagles for Cougarans. There's some very limiting factors to what actually qualifies for that. So when we apply that same metaphor to crypto, if you're going to make a compelling argument that Bitcoin is like Ethereum, you know, there's some very diff very specific differences within the coding. You can maybe make an argument, and I mean, this is not advisable at all that you could maybe say hard fork coins like Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash, you could maybe make that argument for, but if you're not gonna file your 8824, your argument completely falls apart. You didn't do the proper paperwork in order to establish that basis for like kind of exchange. There's no reasonable way that I think that you can actually articulate to a federal judge who's probably 50 to 70 to 80 years old, 
the specifics of why those coins are like enough that they would fall under this jurisdiction, assuming that you can even get past the argument that they're not a security of some sort. Also, when you look at, and this comes directly from that known as 2014-21, the IRS is not like a Twitter account where they're just firing off whatever they feel off the top of their head. Their words are very specifically chosen. When we take a look at what they mention as a capital asset as far as the property designation goes, they specifically mention stocks, bonds, and other investment property are generally capital assets. This is a very subtle peek into how they're starting to view this, and I'll be very curious to see as these court cases develop what actually happens here, but this to me is the biggest warning sign that the IRS is not going to allow like kind exchange. There were a lot of articles that were written at the end of 2017 by different publications, and, and I'm happy to call out, uh, I think it was Bloomberg was one of them, um, and most of the major media publications were saying, like kind exchange is going away for cryptocurrencies and for Bitcoin, and they were really trying to rile up political uh, dissent against the tax cuts bill. Uh, mostly because when they look at what they do and it's a journalistic sleight of hand, they would have an attorney quote what the laws for like kind exchange were, and then they would stop, and then the reporter would make the connection that because cryptocurrencies are property, then like kind exchange applies. If the attorneys actually believed that and it was fully transparent to them that like kind exchange did apply to cryptocurrencies, the attorney would have quoted it and said that. But no attorney would be willing to take that position because it's kind of a frivolous position when you start looking at the laws. So the journalist is then trying to make the connection for you so that they're doing a little bit of jur or journalistic like said, sleight of hand to the extent that it was very misleading in those, those documents. But there hasn't been any recourse against that. I think there's a lot of surprising people because they're reading these major publications that are deliberately giving them bad advice to push them forward on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Bill or Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as opposed to just understanding what the actual law is. They're definitely trying to push an agenda. So walking through some of the basic transactions. We're going to walk through straight purchase and sale. We're going to walk through receiving it. And then we're going to walk through, um, I think, a couple of the more higher level gifting, but not necessarily in this, this context of Eddie buys Ethereum. So if Eddie buys one Ethereum for 100 bucks with a hundred or $1 processing cost, um, he establishes a basis of $101. You always take whatever you pay for the cryptocurrency, add in any transactional costs, and that's your basis. So if he turns around and after 11 months decides that he's going to sell it for 200 and has another processing cost of $2, he's now going to have a capital gain. Is anyone feeling smart enough to guess what his capital gain is? Math on a Monday Short night? Short-term capital gain. Right, yep. We'll get to that in a second. 500? 101? Final answers? It's It's... Whatever the tax rate is for a short-term capital gain on $101. So his capital gain is $97 because we take that basis of 101, we add in the additional $2 of processing cost, and subtract that from his $200 sale. So he's going to report on his taxes that he has a short-term capital gain because it's within a year, and that's one thing that we want to really focus on too, is the longer that you hold your cryptocurrency, once you cross that one year and one day mark, now all of a sudden you're long-term capital gains, and that's a much better tax rate because the first bracket it's actually 0% on a long-term capital gain, as opposed to... What? Exactly. And that's why a lot of people need to be holding on to their capital or their uh, <laughs> cryptocurrency for an extended period of time, because if you're a married filing joint couple, your upper limit for that 1% or that 0% long-term capital gains is about $73,000 a year. What? So if you're living in a low-cost-of-living area, most people can very, very, very comfortably live on $73,000 a year and will owe absolutely zero capital gains tax to the federal government. Now, the issue is because he got impatient and didn't wait the full year, he's going to pay essentially his ordinary gains rate on it. And that's the, the key about short-term capital gains is every dollar that you purchase or basically accumulate, you're going to pay whatever your rate is if you were working at a W-2 job. And that's anywhere from 10 to 37% on the higher ends. And that doesn't even begin to factor in things like net income investment tax if you cross over a certain amount of capital gains, you're actually going to own an additional 3.8% on top of potentially 37%. And that's just your federal tax rate. That doesn't include, for the poor souls in California, up to 13% of capital gains tax in California. They somehow managed to make that 25 oh, every and, time I turn around. And, and don't blame because it's only going to get worse as time goes on with California. That's why I left. But if Eddie were to wait, <laughs> so being in the 15% ordinary income tax bracket, he also falls if he were long-term capital gains in that 0% tax rate. So with... Ordinary incomes and short-term 
capital gains, he's going to owe $14.55 on that transaction. If he would have waited, he would have owed nothing. So that's a very, very, very important thing to remember is the longer that you can sit and hold and not trade coin to coin, because as we discussed, Litecoin Exchange is not applied to cryptocurrency. So all the people that were buying in May of last year and then got excited and started trading as the markets were heating up on different ICO projects, started recognizing the gains as they went along. And a lot of people have actually accumulated a pretty hefty bill. And the market essentially crashed and were, I would say, probably in a relatively low period. Hopefully we're coming out of that soon, but that's not investment advice by any stretch of the imagination. But now they have this liability for uh, taxes, or they have a tax liability that they can't even afford without liquidating their entire portfolio. And we can talk about that a little bit more in a few seconds. Now, if anywhere to earn this Ethereum, anytime that you receive any sort of cryptocurrency as payment, you're going to recognize the fair market value at the time that you receive it. So if he's a, a web developer and he gets four Ethereum at $2,000 essentially for the entire period, so he's got uh, $500 per Ethereum as his basis. He recognizes that as gross income. He's going to subtract out all of his expenses. So he's got a cell phone bill, home office. He wanted to get a brand new MacBook, so he's got a MacBook that he's depreciating. You know, He hires on his kid to, to clean up his home office and can write that off as a legitimate business expense. He totals up his expenses to $1,900. And so he technically has a profit of $100. And so he's going to pay ordinary income tax on that $100 and then self-employment tax as well. And with that, so if he's in the 10% tax bracket, the self-employment tax is 15.3% in addition to your normal income taxes. So he's paying essentially 25.3%. He's going to owe taxes of $25.30. Now, if he had gotten that all the way down to zero, if he had full $2,000 worth of expenses, there's no gain there, but his basis in that four Ethereum remains at $2,000. And he decides that he's going to sell his crypto a month later for $2,500. And because he's established his basis, He's going to recognize a capital gain, a short-term capital gain of $500. And so he'll pay taxes on that. One thing to keep in mind if you are running a crypto-specific business is if you are paying contractors or employees in cryptocurrencies, you do have to treat that as whatever the fair market value was. You're going to give them either a 1099 or a W-2. And for those of you that have actual employees, you do have to remit and um, retain their portion of employment taxes. And the other thing to think about if you're paying your employees in crypto is if you have any sort of gain as a business in that cryptocurrency, so let's say you buy Ethereum a month before you pay it out and the price goes up, the business now has a capital gain on top of owing the income and uh, employment taxes and their portion of that for both state and Fed. So there's some schools of thought that say if you're going to pay in crypto, buy it and fee off cash right before you pay out, and that way you'll minimize whatever the capital gains or losses are. A lot of these ICO projects that raised you know, at a much higher level have a much higher basis in it, so they're actually selling it at a loss. Or when they get paid out in uh, employment capacity, they have a loss there that they might harvest as part of a, a long-term tax strategy. When you work as an employee, you will get that W-2, like I said. But instead of saying, well, we paid you know, Jim 10 Bitcoin, it's only going to say, we paid Jim $50,000. It's not going to mention any part of what the crypto is. So if you decide that you're going to liquidate that crypto, you want to make sure that you're saving that money aside to pay income taxes elsewhere, especially for those that are on the uh, self-employment side, which we quantify as receiving crypto for goods and services. If you are transacting in any sort of business capacity where you are not a direct employee, you are going to get a 1099 for any crypto received in excess of $600, or you should be getting a 1099. The IRS will probably come after businesses and projects that are paying in crypto and not actually you know, doing the correct paperwork. That's W-2s, it's 1099s. Uh, honestly, if you're asking me for my, my opinion as someone that takes crypto as payments, this is the best way to acquire cryptocurrency because you get to establish fair market basis and more often than not, if you have enough expenses to cover that, you're going to get fair market crypto for investing and pay no sort of uh, income tax on it if you structure your, your expenses right and have legitimate expenses. Not to mention with the updates in the new tax law, there's a provision called uh, 199A and what that says is for certain qualified service businesses, as long as you keep it with under or keep your income below a certain amount and I think it's about $200,000 for a married family joint couple, the government's going to give you a 20% deduction around right the top against your net profits. So if you have a profit of $100,000, the IRS is going to give you the equivalent of a $20,000 de deduction without you having to spend a single cent. So if you can make a, a profit on your cryptocurrency through trading, you get to amplify that by having that deduction on there as well.
Also, if you're working on an ICO and you're getting paid in security tokens, and this is one thing that a lot of ICO projects don't understand, is if you say you're a utility token, but then everything that your contractors are doing are under the guise of basically invoking elections that normally go for securities, they can unwind your argument that you have a utility token. And that, we'll jump into ICOs in a second, so um, that's where it gets real fun real quick. Wait, you mean people that I, that I give a token to that's a utility token can go out and file an 83B? And they can and undo. undo your utility token status. So, that so you need to make it their agreements. abundantly clear in those agreements. Oh. Because if you have utility tokens, thanks to the Supreme Court, yep. you're potentially liable for sales tax in the jurisdictions that are going to charge it. There's 13 of the 50 United States right now that charge for software as a service as a sales tax. And so if you serve any of those clients in those areas, not only are you liable for sales tax, you're also potentially liable for income tax on the actual sale of the tokens because it's as if you are transacting goods or services in a retail capacity. And what most people don't realize is when you have research and development costs, as soon as they cross over $50,000, you have the potential to be forced into amortizing those costs. So instead of taking them in that year, you have to stretch out those costs over five years. So now you've got a massive profit margin on a product that, in theory, if you raise $30 million, most states are gonna to wanna to cover that. And there's, there's a lot of talk and chatter in the um, accounting and tax world that now that Wayfair has set the standard that states can go after sales tax in jurisdictions where people aren't operating in business, that more states are going to jump on and such the 13 that do it now. So you can bet your butt that states like California are going to be coming very oh, quickly coming. after. They're coming. That, and every, every state's going to look at that as a very juicy opportunity to make some significant money. And so they're going to take advantage of every opportunity they've got, especially when the law already backs them up at the Supreme Court level. So what an 83B election is, <laughs> circling way back around to where we were, uh, when you get paid in a security, if there's any sort of vesting schedule, you have the option within 30 days of receiving your award letter saying, you know, Drew, hey, we want to pay you in shares of our stock. Um, you're not going to get them right away. They're subject to a lockup period. Here's your award letter saying what you get, and here's what you're going to get in a year. I can file what's known as an 83B election and say, I want to pay my taxes on my award letter in the here and now before I actually get the tokens, because my taxes are going to be significantly lower there. And then by the time that I actually get those tokens, or stocks, or whatever you want to call them, instead of receiving the fair market value for the time that I receive them, I've already set my fair market value, so I only have capital gains. It also starts your ticker on long-term capital gains. So if you know you've got a lock, one-year lockup, why wouldn't you pay less overall ordinary income tax on it, in addition to being able to basically have long-term capital gains the second they come out and get them at a discounted rate? That's a great tool. As long as you're paying attention, you're within those guidelines, and you're making sure that you're not going to blow up your project, or if you've got a clause in your work agreement for your contractors, that they cannot make this election because it is truly a utility token. Also, um, one thing that people don't think about is if you're mining cryptocurrency, this is one of the, the few things that got mentioned in that notice. Mining cryptocurrency is the same as trading uh, services for the good of the network. So every token that you receive in, you're going to recognize at fair market value. Subtract out your expenses, figure out your net profit, and then you have your basis set in your mined tokens. Right now, because most mining operations are basically running at break even or at a loss, this is a great time to be in that space because you have the, the equipment costs that you can essentially write off on top of electricity, on top of you know throwing in a Section 105 plane for your health care, on top of your cell phone. Um, I have a, my wife is a business partner, and we bought brand new phones at the end of last year because we knew that we needed expenses because now, when you purchase a phone through Amazon, they're so generous to stretch out the entire value of the phone over a two-year period that you're paying in a monthly payment plan. Well, because they do that, I can write off the full value of my phone because it's used exclusively for business purposes. So I get to pick up an extra $1,000 deduction for the iPhone 17 or whatever it is now <laughs> um, as a business expense that I don't have to pay the full $1,000, but I can take that against the, the virtual mining income that I have on top of the cost of the contract, on top of... Uh, the office space that I operate out of. There's so many things that we can fill pack on there on top of it that are legal and easy to defend. But this is a fantastic way to accumulate market rate crypto. And I think a lot of people have been doing that for a while. The problem is you have to keep good records in order to make this a defensible position. And like I mentioned before, if you are going to get a 1099, you're going to have $600 or more in cryptocurrency. So if you're hiring contractors that are developers or you know advisors on a project and you're paying them in your tokens and those tokens have a fair market value at the time that you're paying them, Make sure that you're tracking how much you're paying them because you could be liable to be filing a 1099 at the beginning of next year for them. They have to report to the IRS and you as well. If you don't file that 1099, they do charge penalties depending on how many months it's been. So make sure you're keeping good records. ICOs. So 
now that we've covered all the, the individual and, and smaller level business things, there's a lot of diff different projects and things that you want to look for within the ICOs because I don't think a lot of ICOs have thought about, well, if we say that we're a security token and we get pushed back into utility status, what does that mean for our, our taxes? Some ICOs that are, ap are acting as if they're utility tokens are actually treating everything from a security standpoint. So like I mentioned before, you've got jurisdictional issues. There are some projects that are having a management company here in the United States, and they're doing a raise abroad in Estonia or the Cayman Islands or, or what have you. When you raise abroad, you can't just gift those tokens back into your US entity. If you've got US contractors that are operating under the umbrella of that US company, you either need to take those tokens raised abroad and pay them as a fee for service to those projects or have a legitimate loan. There are a lot of projects out there that think that they're being cute by giving themselves a 0% interest loan. And they're finding out that the IRS is coming back and saying, well, this isn't a loan because there's no interest rate. You're not paying back on any of the principal. There's nothing in this other than the name loan that makes this look like a loan. This is actually employment income. So when you're investing in a project that is a registered C Corp, there's a 21% tax rate on that income. So if they've took and raised $100 million and floated that back through as a zero interest loan for all $100 million, technically that project owes $21 million plus penalties, plus interest on any amount that they were trying to be cute with that loan. And that can really hurt a project if they're not handling their finances well, if they only kept a portion in crypto and didn't cash out to cover their taxes. Now they're going to be in a cash crunch because they can't come and drop $21 million on the open market because they're going to sink the price even further. So you, when you're looking at projects, make sure that you have a, a good idea of whether or not they actually have anyone looking at these issues and looking from a legal and tax perspective because that's a great way to see if the project is serious about what they're doing is whether or not they're thinking about these jur jurisdictional issues. Like I mentioned before, the sales tax on the utility tokens is something that I'm not seeing a lot of utility tokens even considering. Most of them haven't even been... Uh, doing the proper KYC as they're going through the utility token process to even know where their customers are. So that's a very ripe target for state revenue boards to come after them and say, well, hey, Jim Bob here in South Dakota declared that he had your token. We have no other reason to believe that all of the money that you raised in, in your ICO wasn't from our state. You have to prove otherwise. If you don't have the due diligence and the paperwork to prove that you've raised from other locations <coughs> and other places, you might end up losing in that state's courts that you actually owe the state a significant amount. I mean, in Colorado, I think our upper tax sales tax limit is 11.25%, depending on what kind of items you're buying, how you're transacting them, and what county you're actually in. It's a huge compliance issue that no one's talking about. And that uh, case Wayfair versus the state of South Dakota really set the, the trap for a lot of these ICO projects that are already embattled with the SEC or whether or not they're security, claiming they're a utility but not acting in that capacity at all. Did Wayfair appeal? It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court overturned it and said the states have the ability to come after anyone, even if they're not in your state. If you're, if the consumer is in the state of, uh, so South Dakota was one leading the charge, and your company's in Nevada, if you're selling them a service because South Dakota taxes services as if they were goods, there's sales tax due on that transaction. And because most services don't have enough expenses, as far as the cost of goods sold go, and even with the research and development having to be stretched out on these, these crypto projects, there's some significant sales tax due on these projects. Sure. Yeah. So, hmm. if you're watching and you're an ICO and you've been thought about this, www.archertaxgroup.com, contact us. <laughs> well, we're doing a lot of work with a lot of projects that I'm not gonna name any names, but need to get caught up very quickly before the cat gets out of the bag. One thing I will say with any kind of uh, taxing authority, if you are leading the discussion and showing them that you're taking the proper steps and have the proper paperwork, you can lead the discussion a lot more and you'll get a lot more leniency as opposed to sticking your head in the sand and waiting for the IRS to come knocking, waiting for the State Board of California to come knocking. Be proactive because there's a lot of people that are not being proactive in this case and the IRS is absolutely going to go after the lowest hanging fruit first. My personal favorite um, reference is all of the brilliant scientists on YouTube that sit there and go, Crypto is not taxable. I'm not going to. I'm never paying taxes on my Bitcoin. I've got all my Bitcoin. And never going to do it. You should never pay it either. And if you like our channel, donate below. You just gave a videotaped confession saying that you have no intention of paying your taxes. So you've just lost the, the defense of whether or not I had intent to defraud the government. The IRS has very clearly published uh, references that crypto is absolutely taxable. 
And we could even make the argument with once again going back to like kind of exchange that if you've got those transactions, you've got taxable transactions. And then you were dumb enough to give them a wallet address that links directly to all of your transactions. And one of the beautiful and terrible things about cryptocurrencies is 99.9% .9 of them are immutable ledgers. Mm -hmm. That is a record that is out there forever. And you say, well, what about Monero and projects like that? Until there's a fiat to Monero entry point, and even still, most of those exchanges are still going to have KYC because they have to, you're going to have a point where you purchase Bitcoin, you move that Bitcoin over to an exchange where you bought Monero, and then you ran Monero through the cycles, and you bought more Bitcoin back out, and put one Bitcoin in, and you pulled 15 out, and now you're selling 15 Bitcoin, the IRS is going to go, where is the remainder of that 14 Bitcoin? Where did that come from? Because if you don't have a place where you can prove the basis of your Bitcoin, tax law states that you have to assume a $0 basis on those coins. Cool. So you will pay 100% capital gains on that Bitcoin. Not to mention probably criminal charges, no one looks good in federal orange, and the, the one thing to remember is when you are talking about clear intent to defraud the federal government, you are dealing with a, basically you've given the IRS no stop, stop watch on when they can come after you, when they can't come after you. you. There's no statute of limitations for how long the IRS can pursue cases of deliberate tax fraud. So if you've got any of those videos up on YouTube, delete them immediately. Um, and maybe change your name and move to a country that doesn't extradite. <laughs> when dealing with putting together your crypto taxes, even if you owe a balance, there's a 10-year statute of uh, limitation for the IRS to collect that balance. So if you're acting in negotiation and you, you, you won't have the ability to um, pay those taxes, let's say you, know, you were a day trader of crypto, you racked up, you know, a $500,000 bill, and then the next year you had a $550,000 loss because you ran into the ground trying to trade futures. There are settlement options. There are payment plans. Um, in some cases, you can get on a partial payment agreement where you won't be able to pay the full amount, but you'll be able to pay a portion of it. The idea is you don't want the IRS coming after you for enforcement action because it's way more expensive to pay a qualified professional to try to argue your case to pay the taxes that you could have potentially paid over a payment plan instead of having additional penalties racked racked in there and dealing with that. So be proactive when it comes to your taxes. Like I said, because they've mentioned that enforcement is coming, there's no amnesty program. Mm -hmm. Those that actually make a good faith effort to comply are probably going to see a lot more leniency than those that are going on YouTube and going on their tirades. I don't like paying taxes. I don't think anyone's overjoyed it when April 15th comes around. But if you're proactive, you're going to have a much better time arguing your positions than trying to not only fight off the tax bill, but also criminal proceedings as well. So. Be wary of that, and not to mention substantial understatement of your tax liability is an immediate 20% penalty on top of the tax liability that you owe, on top of three other penalties, and it does not fall off under a first-time penalty abatement. I've seen a couple articles written by a couple different people, and the, the law side of things that talk about, well, here's how we present our case of, well, this is what our thought process was, this is why this is a reasonable position to take. You have to be very, very cautious on doing that because there's no guarantee that those penalties are going to drop off, and not all penalties drop off in those cases. The first time penalty abatement is literally a phone call that says, Dear Father IRS, forgive me for I have sinned. They drop off probably about 75% of the penalties, depending on what penalties you have. Substantial understatement of tax liability is not one of those penalties. They do not look kindly on accuracy related penalties. Um, also, if you know that you're going to have a gain for the year, you can try to make estimated tax payments. Um, your dates are April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and then January 15th of the last year. You're supposed to be paying either 90% of your liability for that tax year or 100% of your tax liability the year before. If you don't, it's a half a percent penalty, which just doesn't seem like a lot. But when you start talking massive amounts of money, that stacks up really quickly. That's another penalty that does not just disappear with the first time penalty abatement. So, once again, circling way back around because we can go down so many different rabbit holes and I can't wait for the Q&A because that's the fun part for me. Um, the awards to employees or contractors is another thing that most people aren't paying attention to. If you have a project or a business where you are paying in cryptocurrency, make sure you're doing your due diligence and getting the appropriate W-9s and uh, filing the appropriate state and federal uh, payroll taxes because you don't want to have to deal with the penalties. And also don't get cutesy and say, well, they, they're a contractor when actually they operate as an employee. You want to make sure that you've got a very clear line and you understand the 20 different points that the artist looks at because there's all sorts of penalties for people that are trying to skirt paying employment taxes in order to have independent contractors. So if you have questions on that, once again, reach out to us. We're more than happy to walk through those items. Gifting is something that I think a lot of people want to do but don't know how to do. Um, we were talking a little bit before this uh, presentation started about um, step-up basis. So if you have cryptocurrency and you pass away because it is property, 
your descendants will get step up basis. So when you die and pass it on, the fair market value steps up to whatever, or the, the basis of your cryptocurrency steps up to the fair market value for your descendants. <clears throat> People who decide that they can't wait until they die to give gifts to family, you know, maybe you've got a niece or nephew that you're thinking, well, I'll, I'll buy some Bitcoin for them, throw it into an, you know, a wallet for them, and when it comes time for college, it'll be worth $100,000. Yay. The issue is, if you gift cryptocurrency, and if you're going to gift it, keep it under $15,000, because you don't have to report anything as far as your lifetime limitation for gifts against your state um, exemption. And the reason why you want to keep under that limitation is the taxes get really egregious really fast on that. That's the death tax that everyone talks about. If it's under $15,000, there's nothing to report. When you give that gift, uh, your recipient of the gift receives your basis in that cryptocurrency. So if I was a crypto OG and bought it in 2013, my basis is 10 cents and the fair market value is $6,000. If I give that to my nephew, his basis in it is $10,000. So if he sells it, he's going to recognize the gains I wouldn't recognize otherwise, which is why it's so important that if you have a will, if you're considering end of life or want to make sure that you're setting up your loved ones, because you never know, you know, you could be 25 and you could die tomorrow, not to be morbid. That step up basis really helps out in that they don't have to worry about the massive tax hit because you got over eager and gave it to them right away. So just be aware of that um, in those issues. And I think we'll see a very interesting emergence of estate planning around cryptocurrencies. Most of the people that I've talked to are in the, that like 20 to 37 demographic that they're not even thinking about a will or passing on items. Um, it'll be a very interesting cottage industry to see how crypto develops in estate planning and considerations, especially with people having multiple keys and, you know, uh, different <coughs> phrases and things like that. You should probably, if, if you're feeling paranoid that you don't want to give it to one person, find two estate attorneys, give one half, give the other half, and give your buddy or the executor of the estate the actual instructions of how to piece those together so they know how to go after and, and pull that out. Because I can't even begin to imagine how much, you know, cryptocurrency could be lost because someone was too paranoid in their life and didn't ever tell, you know, their wife or their sp or, uh, spouse or kids, here are my crypto investments, here's how you get to them. So be wary of that. Like I said, if you gift your property before you die, they inherit your basis. So keep that in mind when you're giving that. But if you do an app, if you give it, if it's in your will, then it's the basis of whatever the fair market value at Correct. the time of your death or the time of the transfer is. Correct. Will or living trust only. They used to even, be will, living trust even, only. Even even wills. So you don't have to have a living trust to do that. Trust is a whole. If y'all want to sit down and talk trusts. We can talk trust another time. That I mean, that's like going 14 layers deep into the, the rabbit hole. And then you've got foreign trusts and revocable, irrevocable. Yeah, it gets it gets real fun real quick. I say fun in a very serious. I love I love tax law. I love love that planning. Revocables are very fun. Irrevocables. Irrevocable. Well, more fun. As long as you don't have to unwind them because someone did something incorrectly, and that's where it becomes a complete pain in the bottom. That is true. So one of the biggest things that that is just now coming out on the tax side of things that that they're not even really applying to cryptocurrencies we're talking about, is this concept concept called qualified opportunity zones. And the general idea behind this, and obviously this is a topic that you need to talk to a qualified tax professional because there are so many ways that you can misstep in this. Don't, don't try this at home. This is trained professional talking. If you have capital gains that you reinvest in one of these designated qualified opportunity zones, you can actually forestall the payment of capital gains until 2026. On top of that, if you hold property in a qualified in, or opportunity zone for five years, they give you a 10% discount on the overall capital gains. And at seven years, they give you an additional 5% discount. And then at 10 years, whatever property you have in that qualified zone, the fair market value becomes the new basis. Fun fact, so I'm up in Longmont. Because this is all based on 2010 census data, as determining where these QOZs are, the entirety of downtown Longmont actually follows falls in a QOZ. Real estate is an asset class that you can invest in. So if you've got cryptocurrency that you want to cash out on, but you don't want to pay the capital gains on, you can turn around and, and purchase real estate. And there's a couple of caveats of what you have to do with that real estate to maintain compliance with QOZ. That's a huge, huge benefit because you can depreciate that property out over 30 years. And if the property value continues to go up in Colorado like they seem to like to do, Whenever we hit that 10 year mark, you could turn around and sell that capital asset for zero capital gains. And so looking at that as a potential um, move, especially if you're going to invest in 
um, they call them non-vice businesses. So it's no strip clubs, no liquor stores, yeah, all, all the no fun things. No, no but, fun, no fun. All right. No fun. <laughs> no fun. Um, or investing in a fund that then invests in businesses within a QOZ. So I was actually at a, a conference last week in Vegas where I was talking to a project where these guys are literally opening up these massive mining operations, and instead of them purchasing the equipment, they are telling people, send us your mining equipment, well, you pay us for the electricity and the management fee, and we will operate your mining equipment in this space. If they were to set that business up within a QOZ, anyone that buys or sells Bitcoin to buy miners, and then puts that miner in that QOZ and leaves that miner in there, now doesn't have to pay capital gains on that Bitcoin that they cashed out because that business is technically domiciled in a QOZ. Things like that we can get real creative with real quickly. Um, uh, again, this is not something that you want to talk to anyone other than a qualified, and I put this all in caps in case anyone didn't catch the, the four times that I've said this, consult a professional before attempting because there are a lot of things that you can do to misstep. It's worth putting the blame on somebody else that's got the liability insurance to cover this kind of misstep. Don't try this at home. Um, like I said, one of the things that no one's really talking about is the fact that this reduces your capital gains. So you will have that sunset date in 2026 where you're going to have to pay the capital gains. But if you were to offer me the option between you know, cashing out and reinvesting in something that's going to continuously generate me income, especially on the real estate front, uh, and then offer me an additional 15% discount on the taxes that I would have owed anyways for cashing out, that's a no-brainer in a lot of cases. Um, there will be some, some groups that are going to start putting together funds to do that. So even if you only have $10,000 and you want to invest in that, you can purchase shares of stock in these funds. So keep an eye on that. Like I said, if you have questions, please, please, please come talk to me. A little bit of a passion project considering the entirety of where I live is in one of these QOZs. Any questions from, from the crowd? Any, anybody have a friend that did something potentially illegal that they've got a question on? I have a friend that mines a lot of Monero. OK. Um, and uh, hasn't cashed out any okay. of it. So it just has a bunch of Monero in a wallet somewhere. Um, what what, li what liability uh, would he or she be looking at? Uh, I mean, if they were to I mean, go on local, local Bitcoins or something like that and turn it into... Turn it into so the, in a case like that, it depends. Do, do they have a profit from mining Monero? So they're going to owe ordinary income tax and self-employment tax on the Monero that was mined that was profit. Mm -hmm. Do they have, uh, after setting that basis and then turning around and selling it on Bitcoin or local Bitcoins? Local Bitcoins or something like that, yeah. Like shape shift it from Monero into Bitcoin and then sell that Bitcoin uh, on local Bitcoins. Did, did they put that cash in a bank account or anything that would be inherently traceable? Because the honest answer is... in a briefcase. You're in a briefcase, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. When you have taxable events, you are required to claim that income. So if there was ever a way that your friend got caught, and the IRS will catch up, and it might not be today, it might not be three years from now, it might be ten years from now, they're going to get hit with the taxes on the, the business side of things. They're going to get hit taxes or with taxes on the capital gain side of things. So they potentially owe a liability there. So depending on how many dollars of potential Monero sales we're talking about. It's a really good idea to get in, get that information amended on a return, get that return filed, and just be in compliance. That is to wait for the IRS to come after your friend. Fair enough. Matt. We keep recording. One real quick. Does hobby income apply, like the limit? If it's under X amount of dollars, could you say it's hobby income? It's not really beneficial to claim hobby income because you have a loss limitation on, on your hobby. So if you're mining, and you're mining at a loss, as long as you have a business plan and an intent to make money, and this is, there's been a couple court cases of doctor's wife decides that she wants to start running a stable for show ponies and it operates at this massive loss, but they've got no business plan, they're not taking on other clients other than their own individual horses, um, and they're using that loss, because when you have a, a business loss, dollar for dollar, you can apply that against your ordinary income. So if you've got, you know, let's say, um, six grand of losses for your mining income that we're claiming as an actual legitimate business because it, it is and would fall into that. And you've got a hundred thousand dollars of ordinary income from your job. You can actually take that six thousand dollars directly against that with no limitation. When you have capital loss in excess of your capital gains, you're loaded with three thousand dollars. So the mining, especially when you're mining at a loss, and as long as you have a business plan and an intent to make money, it's a great way to pull 
against other taxable income and reduce that overall. So I would not advise claiming it as hobby income because there's really not a benefit from the loss perspective. And most miners that I'm aware of are losing money significantly right now. Semi-tangential. If you are a songwriter, uh -huh. your tax is 50% of your royalties. Correct. It's brutal. You cannot hold it through a corporation right. and just pay corporate tax. You have to pay the 50%. Right. With the advent of crypto and all of our digital rights management, do those tokens now somehow transmute that so that you only have to pay ordinary income tax or are they because you can if, call it an altcoin right if if it comes from a royalty they're probably going to leave it at that designation the the crypto does not inherently change the transaction it's no different than getting your royalties paid out in gold or silver coins you're still going to owe that tax for the the genesis of that so for those companies that are paying artists in crypto you need to treat it exactly the same. So the songwriters pay 50%, and this is what I don't understand. Yeah. If the songwriter declares bankruptcy and their royalties are then purchased by an organization, that organization can now get the royalties, write everything off through an LLC, and it's, reduce the it's, royalty It's payment. an investment vehicle now as opposed to... So why... Contact your local congressperson. Okay. <laughs> um, just curious about the QOZ. Has anybody done a toe test yet? And see how cold or hot the water is in there? So the... And all the continuing education I'm doing, it's all these attorneys getting hyped about it. That means this, this literally became a thing as of November of last year. And so everyone's rushing to interpret the law and put these, these groups together. It's going to be a huge market very, very quickly. And not all funds are going to be run well. So caveat enter with that. So you could put a co-working space in a QOZ yep. and domicile a whole bunch of ICOs in the QOZ that could then be invested in because their business is in the QOZ. As long as, well, so they, they can invest in the business regardless. The question is whether or not there's a substantial amount of assets for that business. It has to think it's like 90% of the assets of that business have to be in that QOZ. Yeah. And so if you're going to have IP that you put abroad that you're then licensing out, now we've got all sorts of issues within that. And the only benefit there is for investors being able to actually actively invest in that business. Now you're absolutely a security token because you can't just buy tokens right. of that ICO. It has to be a bona fide security in that space. But yet, I like where your head's at. There's a lot of things that we can do planning-wise around that. I'm sure but there's, there's a building there's, in Longmont that needs I'm, like I'm a sure working space. Plenty of, well, so you could do it in multiple ways. You could have an individual that buys an old warehouse building, meets all the rehab requirements, that then leases that space out to a uh, startup accelerator that sold a bunch of capital assets to then lease that space, the, the investors in the capital, or the accelerator gets to further capital gains, the person that bought the building gets to further capital gains, and then anyone that brings startup money into the businesses that are leasing the space from the accelerator, who's leasing the space from the real estate person, deferral of capital gains essentially all the way around. Oh, I think we'll do that. Yeah. I have a, a follow-up question, and you said 90% of your assets have to be domiciled in that QOZ to meet yes. that requirement. If you're an ICO, I mean, almost all your assets admit it for the starting portion are going to be in cryptocurrency so I mean if you just got your a copy of the private key and, and like, on, the cold on the storage premise, in, in the cold storage on the premise that's 90 percent of your assets potentially the requirement but the issue that we're seeing with a lot of the ICOs is because they're doing a raise abroad we have to figure out specifically who technically owns the asset if the IRS is going to come back and say well you did a fundraise by proxy in a different mm -hmm. jurisdiction and then say, well, you're actually holding these assets in the Cayman Islands when you're actually operating here. Okay. And the other issue that comes in, too, is if you don't have a team that is centrally located and you've got employees all over the country, mm -hmm. it's 90% of your actual team in the space and operating in that space. It's not just the assets. It's, it's essentially, think of 90% of the business being 90% of the business needs no. to be there, not just assets. Correct. Got it. So, and once again, this is very, very high level of a very complex issue. If you want to talk specifics, we need to talk individual cases as far sure. as what, what goes on there. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to get a general, yeah. general idea. Is this QOZ thing, is it nationwide or just Colorado? Every, every state has QOZs that were defined by the census data and the governors of, of the area. So I've got a couple clients in St. Louis and there's all sorts of pockets and literally one street over can be different than, you know, one block is not essentially equivalent. And so there's a lot of opportunity if you know real estate investing Mm -hmm. that you can go and literally turn around neighborhoods. So, I mean, the fact that the whole of Longmont's there, there's pockets in Denver, Commerce City, 
south of the town. I mean, 2010 was a lifetime ago as far as Colorado's real estate market is concerned. Some really hot up and coming areas are technically in QOZs. And so you could potentially buy, buy a building and rehab the snot out of it because most people don't put money back into these buildings and have a legitimate real estate investment portfolio that is going to pay significant dividends in the, the very near future of 10 years. Mm. Yeah, I have rental properties. I have no idea, idea if they're in them or not. Well, so if you purchase them before this law went into effect, you can't transfer those into a related entity that you hold. You'd have to sell those properties and then buy new properties in those zones. So there's no grandfathering. It's after this law was passed, you have to go Correct. make that purchase. They're trying to stimulate those downtrodden. Yeah, yeah, makes, all right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, for shapeshift, I've mm -hmm. heard uh, that different tax laws apply. Can you speak to the tax liability of it? So if, if you are a U.S. citizen, you're going to owe U.S. taxes, whether you're in the United States or abroad. Capital gains transactions are, they're not exempted through foreign income exclusion. So if you're in Germany and you're trading cryptocurrency and you get to, ex you know, you work for a, a tech company out there, you can throw out the first hundred thousand dollars of your ordinary income. Your capital gains are always going to be taxable in the United States. What? Right. Mm. It's a whole whole another issue. Wait, there. what? Don't even get me started on Puerto Rico because that's a whole different mess. Oh no, I got there. friends in Cayman who are expecting zero percent tax. Well, www.archertaxgroup.com. <laughs> Contact us. Ooh, baby. So with with shapeshift and and this is kind of the, the issue that I have with I, from a conceptual standpoint, I love decentralized exchanges. The problem is. Even if you're going to an exchange that models the transactions, you're going to have some sort of entry point, you're going to have some sort of exit point. The drug dealers normally don't get caught when they're selling the drugs. They get caught when they buy a $4 million mansion and they claim that they have $2 of income and they can't prove where the money came from to buy that mansion in cash. Same thing with cryptocurrencies. You might get away with, with doing those transactions, but at the end of the day, the onus is on the taxpayer to keep those records and to actually pay the taxes on that crypto in order when they cash out to have a reasonable basis and have that actual calculation to pay those taxes legitimately. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to try and get cute with you know, Monero and Shapeshift and moving things around and trying to obscure. At some point, Fiat's going to hit your bank account or you're going to have a, a suitcase, as some friends do, under your bed that now that's a liability that if you were to have a, a surprise revenue agent show up at your door and go through and they cut the mattress open and there's Two hundred thousand dollars. I think it's a really hard sell that that wasn't deliberate, an intentional flouting of tax law. So, um, other question: If you were considering as an employee accepting cryptocurrency, but you mm -hmm. also have the option of fiat, how would you go about making the decision of which to accept? First of all, is, is the cryptocurrency worth anything? You know, there's something to be said about going with the established coins and whether or not you're willing to take on the volatility risks. I mean, if you would have paid someone. In January, they would have gotten a lot less Bitcoin, and now the value of that Bitcoin is significantly less. So if you don't need to cash that payment out, once again, this is kind of a great investment strategy. I would push more for the independent contractors to consider this as opposed to the employees because there's so much more that we can fill pack as far as expenses go. And with that uh, 199A, that adds an extra 20% bump on top of that that you don't even have to spend money to, to get. So when you run the numbers, as long as you're a bona fide independent contractor and maybe you're working on multiple projects, we can say I'm not tied economically to one project specifically. That becomes a huge, huge tool. And there's some different investment things that we can do on the back end as well to further drop that down. But for an employee, I would say, do I have the financial wherewithal to, to cover my expenses? I don't have to be liquidating this cryptocurrency willy-nilly. I want to be able to sit it and park it for that long-term capital gain. And two, is the company that I work for reputable enough that they're going to withhold the taxes and they're going to do everything correctly and issue me that W-2? Because if they're not going to do that, generally there's not liability on the individual side. But if you've got a company that can't figure that portion out and they're going to pay you in their native tokens, eh, probably not a great project to be working for in the long term because they're going to get blown up by lawsuits, probably by the SEC, you know, state jurisdictional boards. It's just not worth dealing with that headache unless you've got something that you know is relatively safe in that, in, in my opinion. And that's everyone's got their own risk tolerances. Like I said, there's things that I will do that are probably riskier than most tax professionals would encourage, um, but I take payment for crypto in in my business. We had a lot of people that we did end of year tax planning at the very beginning of December, wrote it up, sold some before Christmas, sold some after Christmas, waited till December 31st and sold some in 2018. 
to defer that capital gain. In your bull market, yeah, take that payment and sit on it and grow, grow your holdings in a market right now. That's up to you. If you think it's going to slide further, I'd probably advise against it. Awesome. I'll, I'll flush my my contact information. This QR code. We've got a couple of um, different tax forms and tools that are all downloadable in Google Docs. At this QR code, it'll also take you to our website. Um, it's actually a super secret QR code. It's not actively listed on our website. So, if you want access to those forms, you have to go through that QR code. But otherwise, this is all my contact information. Um, if you want to email me, I love emails. But like I said, we do have the ability to um, schedule free 15-minute consultations. If you've got a lot of for my friend questions that you don't want to ask, ask here as they're being recorded, <laughs> please reach out to us. We want to make sure that everyone is at least compliant to the point that they're not going to get destroyed come 2017's deadline, <coughs> October 15th for those with extensions. And then obviously coming into 2018 as well, there's a lot of considerations, especially for those independent contractors seeking crypto payments.